Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. I'm Andrea. And I'm Andrew. And this is episode 32 and we're very happy to see you all again. And we've got a fun and exciting program for you. Our lace, garment and hat knit along is coming to a close. 30th of June is the cutoff date. But we do have a great interview with a brilliant designer who is well known for her lace designs and that's Romy Hill. And then we're going to one of the most exotic places on planet Earth to meet Christy, who is our guest for Knitters of the World. Yep. We're, we're featuring new releases and extreme knitting on the show. We have a book review from Andrea. Andrea is also taking an in-depth look at one of the patterns from Tilly and the Buttons. That's a very groovy dress, which she has made for Madeline, looking yep. at that very closely. And I'll be giving you a look at the progress on my Fair Isle hat, um, including looking at how I am decreasing while staying in pattern. Yes. But first we have Bring and Brag. Yes, with me. So for new viewers, I am a deeply committed knitter who has had to take a break from knitting because of a repetitive strain injury in my elbows. And in our last uh, episode, episode 31, yep. we interviewed Carsten Demers, who is the author of the newly released book, Knitting Comfortably, The Ergonomics of Knitting. And Carsten is a physiotherapist who teaches knitters how to avoid injuries or arm pains while they're knitting. So if you have pain while you're knitting, that's an interview you probably want to check out. In the meantime, while I'm recovering, I've been delving into the world of sewing, and that's what I'm going to show you now. I've just completed the Zadie dress, which is a pattern by Tilly and the Buttons, and I've done it for Madeline. And it's a pattern that uses stretch material, like a medium weight stretch material. So Ponte, interlock, jersey, double knit. And it's a really cute pattern with an interesting uh, construction. This is it here, and I'll also put some photos of Madeline wearing it alongside. And what first of all is striking is that you've got this Z shape um, seam. So it starts here, the seam starts at the, at the neckline and it goes down to the armhole in a raglan uh, sleeve and then it goes back into the waist center and then back out again for the side seam. And that happens on the front piece as well. As the back piece. And what's cool about that is that it means that the side seams come down to a very neat point here, a triangular point. And this is a dress that you can color block with. So you could do it in a whole, I've just, I've got two colors here, but you could do the skirt in one color, the bodice in another, the side panels in another. You can go to town with a lot of different colors. So the the bodice is very fitted across here and it has a, a empire waistline. An empire waistline is just a, a waistline that sits somewhere between the high waist and under the bust line. And all of the Jane Austen movies, so Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility and Emma, they all of the costumes in those movies are or have this um, empire waistline because that was the fashion of that era. Yep. I think the similarities end there, though. Yes. <laughs> yes, I don't think they had knit fabric back then. No. So, um, and then the skirt is fuller over with more volume over the hips like this. And what's super cool about this construction is you've got these diagonal seams here which conceal very large pockets. And that's super groovy. <laughs> yeah. So it's a great design. Um, I took some risks when making this because I picked not quite the right fabric. So Tilly says to make sure you've got to use stretch material and stretch material should stretch widthwise and lengthwise. And Tilly says to make sure that your material will stretch widthwise 20% more than its original width and that it'll ping back into shape after stretching. Well, I totally love this black and white fabric here, this print, printed one, and it only stretches lengthwise. It does a beautiful stretch, more than 20%, and pings back correctly, so that's great, but it does, only stretches in one direction. This black fabric on the outside is double knit, and it's the, the correct fabric to use, 
and that does stretch in both directions and I thought the, the pattern looks great having dark material on the outside because it really emphasizes the waist and makes it a lot more slimming and this material is in the areas that are close fitting around the body that really need a good flip fit so that's around here and around the shoulders so I thought I could get away by using the correct fab fabric here. The skirt is very big, so it doesn't need to be fitted at all. It doesn't even need stretch fabric down here. So that just left me with the front and back bodice pieces. So I cut out these bodice pieces in the opposite direction than what they were meant to be cut out. So it does stretch, you can have a look now. That's a good 20% stretch and pings back to shape. Good. But it doesn't stretch lengthwise. So that was a bit risk risky for me to take that on, but I think I've got away with it and I think it works. The other thing is this material is slightly heavier than this, but I think I've managed to make it work. The dress has got a really interesting construction, so I thought I'd take some pictures of the different stages as I sewed it up together just to show you. And I'm not giving anything away here because Tilly has a wonderful blog where it's free to read whether you've bought the, the pattern or not. And she takes you by the hand and takes you step by step through the construction of the dress very, very clearly. It's, a, it, it's perfect for beginners, I'd, I'd say. So how you do this, and I'm going to cover Andrew up again with photos, is you start the, the front and the back uh, sewn separately completely to, and then you join together with a very long side seam. So you start off with the skirt piece and you put in some pleats here at the waist. After you've done that you attach it to this bodice piece here and then you're going to attach the very large pocket facings to the side seams and you should see a picture of that now. The next thing you do is attach the front side panels and they are very very long because they're the other side of the pocket underneath. So you'll start at the side seam and you'll sew around the bottom of the, the pocket and up to a point here on the waistband and then you start at the underarm and you do this princess seam sewing again towards same point and this is probably the most trickiest part of the garment. Tilly calls it a pivot point. It's right here and you've got all in all four seams that come to an exact point. So you've got this waist seam here, you've got this princess line bodice seam coming down to the same point, you've got the seam that's the facing of the pocket and the skirt, it joins the facing to the skirt, that's coming up to this point. And then you've got the seam of the side panel coming up to this point. So that's really tricky. And the technique of that, you've got four different seams that are sewn towards this point and the last stitch of each seam has to go in the same point. So in a sense, that last stitch uh, sort of all piled up on each other. And what that does, is make sure that there's no holes at this point and that the colour blocking comes out correctly and it's a really neat finish. So that's a really fiddly bit and that happens both here and here on the front and on the back. The front is more difficult and fiddly because you've got the added pockets but the back you work the same way. So you take the skirt piece, you put in the, the pleats, you attach it to the, the bodice and then you attach the, uh, the back side panels. Then what you're up to, if you're gonna do cap sleeves like me, you get your cap sleeve and you hem it, and that's this section here, and then you attach it to the front bodice with a raglan sleeve seam. So you do that on both of them, and then you flip it around and attach it on the back also with a raglan shaped seam. You're nearly done. What comes next is probably the second most trickiest part of the construction and that's putting the neckband on and that took me a couple of goes because the first time my neckband was too sloppy. So what you have to do is the neck, you make the neckband up so you get your neckband and you close it so it's a closed loop and that should be, the circumference of the neckband should be 
Tilly says, 10% shorter than the circumference of the neck hole. So you get your neck hole and you measure it from this point to this point and then the neck band should be 10%. Now mine ended up being closer to 15 to 20% shorter um, so that it didn't gape. And then you've got to uh, pin it around and I should be showing you a photo of that now all evenly and you sew that around. And then finally you're up to sewing the side seams and hemming it and then you're finished. So it's a really cute dress. I'm super happy with the way it's turned out. When you're sewing up the side seams at the end, that's your chance to do extra fitting and take in the waist or let out the waist. I took in the waist a little bit more for Madeline just so it, it fits you really well. It's a great design and Tilly's patterns are perfectly written for a beginner. She spells out everything you need to know. Hello everyone, my name is Christy and I live in Exmouth which is in a very remote part in the tropics of Western Australia. I was taught to knit by my mother when I was a child but then I stopped in my early teens and I only started again a couple of years ago when I went on a free form knitting and crochet workshop. It was only just over a year ago that I had my first go at following a knitting pattern. And the first project I ever made was this beaded lace shawl, which might seem a bit challenging for a beginner knitter. But I did spend quite some time on Ravelry looking at patterns and I deliberately chose one where a lot of people had already made it. They said that the pattern was well written and where the designer has a support group so I knew there was plenty of backup available if I needed it. Living in a small remote community I rely heavily on the internet for tutorials. Since making this shawl I've made quite a few others in fingering and lace weight yarns and I've had my first forays into sock and garment knitting. I very quickly discovered that I don't like plain stockinette stitch or garter stitch. My preference is for designs with a lot of interest in the form of lace, cables or colour work. This is the freeform shawl I made that reintroduced me to knitting after a 30 year break. It is mostly knitted and includes some crochet as well so I had to have a crash course in basic crochet stitches so I could make this. Not only did discovering freeform um, spark my interest in knitting and crochet, but it also led to a current community project I am coordinating for the Exmouth Cultural Arts Centre, where we are creating a large section of coral reef entirely from knitting and crochet. Most of the work for this does not follow established patterns. For example, I freeform knitted this piece of coral to match a photo that I found. I'm wearing the first two garments that I made, both very simple designs that are well written and easy to follow. This top is a straightforward garment consisting of two rectangles knit sideways and then the sleeves are picked up and knit down. The pattern is made with drop stitches that form this open lacy effect. With this skirt you can see that the direction of the stitches is on the bias. And the pattern is written so that it has a side seam. But from reading the project pages on Ravelry, I found another knitter who had given clear directions on how to knit the skirt and then graft the open edges together to form a hidden seam, eliminating a side seam and giving a neater finish. I really like working with lace weight yarns. And this shawl is from my favorite shawl designer, Boo Knits. It does have some patterning on the wrong side rows, which means a little bit more concentration is required. And it's knit from a lace weight silk yarn. I'm also a fan of gradient yarns, and I think they are a way of adding extra interest to a shawl, as you can see in this example. It may seem strange to live in the tropics and knit sweaters, but I really do notice the cold whenever we go away. To avoid getting too hot while knitting, I have the weight of the garment on a table instead of on my lap. 
This cardigan is knit in fingering weight to make it lighter. It has this really nice lace border for which I've used a gradient yarn from an Australian dyer Aussie farmers market and I added in extra rows in the main colour just to tone down the pinks a little. This was a real learning experience for me. I used a superwash merino yarn for the garter section and after I soaked it and left it flat to dry I found that the sleeves had stretched and were ended up six inches too long. So I had to cut the sleeves and then regraft them to make them shorter. Another feature of this cardigan is the lovely shaping at the back which drops down lower than the front. I like to pay attention to finishing details. So on this one, I have put grow grain ribbon inside the button bands to stop them from stretching. And as a final touch, I have a little personalised label. Watching the Fruity Knitting podcast introduced me to Alice Starmore's Tudor Roses book. I've already knit one design from this book. That's the Elizabeth I sweater that I'm wearing. And here I have all the yarns ready to cast on for the Catherine of Aragon jacket. Now I was taught to knit English style so I throw and hold the yarn in my right hand. Because I want to knit stranded colour work, I've been learning continental style knitting holding the yarn in my left hand so that I can knit two-handed. To practice, I've been working on smaller projects. This Christmas stocking is a great colour work project. It only involves the two yarns and as it's knit in bulky weight it works up really quickly but it has some extra interest with a two colour cast on and a Latvian braid. In smaller yarns I knit this pair of fingerless gloves with a different design on the outside to the inside but again only using the two yarns. Another good way of practicing colour work is with sock knitting and there's lots of lovely sock patterns available. This is the pair that I'm working on at the moment. The first pair of colour work socks I knitted were really way too small because what I found was that the strands would cut across the gap in the centre of the sock and therefore they tightened up and made it unwearable. What I do now when I'm knitting my socks is I turn them inside out and this means that the strands or the floats are carried around the outside diameter of the sock which keeps them looser and makes for a better fit. Welcome back. A big thank you to Christy for that contribution. Christy's crocheted and knitted coral was beautiful. Yeah, I mean, crocheting and knitting a coral reef for a display is such a cool idea because you can use all of these novelty yarns. And here's a photo of some more of her work, which is including a crocheted turtle, which is just <laughs> gorgeous. <laughs> so Christy lives in Exmouth, which is really remote. Australia. The nearest town is three and a half hours drive away and her nearest local yarn store is 1,300 kilometres north of the state capital which is Perth. So Christy gave us some extra photos and information for us to share with you because she really lives in the most amazing and exotic place. Exmouth is right on the uh, by the Ningaloo Reef 
which is a World Heritage Zone. So they get a lot of visitors coming to watch the migratory visits of whale sharks and humpback whales and the turtles which nest over summer. The population of Exmouth is around 2,500, but in the tourist season, which is in winter, this figure triples. So I have to tell you about the temperatures because they're crazy. In winter, the average is 20 degrees Celsius or 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's just winter. That's like a, a pretty warm German summer. And the maximums in summer go to over 45 degrees Celsius or 114 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that is like walking into a fan-forced oven. And Christy still knits. What a legend. <laughs> There's no traffic lights or roundabouts and the biggest traffic jam is caused by emus, as you should be able to see in this photo. Christy says that other local visitors include parentes, which are large lizards, and the one in this photo is holding on to the fly screen of their bedroom window and it's over one and a half metres long. So you may have noticed that Christy has an English accent and that's because she is English. She and her husband moved to Exmouth from the UK nine years ago and they must have loved living there so much because they convinced Christy's mother to move there from the UK six years ago. So Christy says that one of the downsides to living in Exmouth is the cyclones. They don't come every year, but when they do come, they're hugely destructive. So, Christy, thank you so much for being on our show. It's been a thrill to have you on our show. Not only are you an inspirational knitter, but it's been super cool to be able to show our visitors this exotic place where you live. That is just an incredible spot. Yeah. I've hey. never been there. But my sister, my elder sister, she travelled around the Northern Territory in a camper van for six months. And I remember my mum flew up to spend some time with her and they went to Exmouth. And yeah. I remember this because she showed me these beautiful underwater photos that they took when they went snorkeling on the reef. Yeah. 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 So I can that imagine that would be stunning. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful, but a world away. Yeah. yeah. So we're up to you now for we're under to, construction. Yeah. Well, it's meant to be under construction. Right now, I have to say it's actually under destruction because <laughs> I, I was doing two-handed feral back picking, but I've gone back to one-handed now because I was a bit scared. But I'm doing backpicking of the two colours and I'm backpicking knit two togethers and all sorts of stuff. I noticed a, a mistake. I think I've found a mistake. We need to check this out. Um, it's right back a whole another row. Yeah. So anyway, so I was meant to be here telling you how I was managing to do this um, decreasing while staying in pattern, but it's what I've actually done is decreasing while almost staying in pattern. Yeah. I can't, I can't, yeah. Um, yeah, but it is coming along well. Um it's a we little did, bit bigger than what you saw last time. Yeah, it's a bit bigger. There has been some forward progress. Yeah, <laughs> um, We have decided to make a couple of modifications. I've got – this is not the last hat or the – it's both the last hat and the first hat that I made. Um, so, And that's how it fits and I like it. So I think Andrea always says it needs to come down more. I don't like it down more. Um, so it sort of comes down to a little bit below my ears. Andrea also says that my head is a, funny a strange shape. shape. I think it's because <laughs> I've got a compact brain. He's um, very short from the crown to the earlobe. No, everyone else is a bit long from the crown <laughs> to the earlobe. Um, so we figured, and I looked, if you look at the, um, the project page for the Booster Beanie by Quadrin Johnson, um, you can see it is quite long. I think it's a really cool design, but it is quite a long hat, right? And I think it's very, I like it, but I don't think it's necessarily right for a bloke. So, um, you don't want any slouch. Yeah, you like and I also, it pretty tight. yeah, I like it. I mean, I like my hat short anyway. And um, I also thought this seems to be fairly tight on my head. And I did just imagine that if I had a tight hat, hat around my head and then this sort of loose bit off the, the end that was a bit too tight, <laughs> it might come up with a bad look. So, we had to take two of these repeats out. Right. Yeah. And we had to do two so that this pattern, once we start decreasing, because I didn't want to go thinking that all through, these patterns, they're the same, but they're actually reversed. And the decreasing works with the pattern as it is. So I had to take two out so we were doing the right juk juk thing. Anyway, so that's what I'm up to. I've got a couple of rows through that. It's a little well bit enough. risky. 
because it's going to end up... Yeah. We, he, he wants 19 centimetres from the crown to the earlobe and this is going to work out a little bit less than that 18 and three quarters or whatever, or 18 and a half. So I actually put him up a quarter size needle. You won't notice that when it's blocked out, but it might just give a little bit of extra length. And by yep. the time you finished it, it should be a perfect fit. Yep, yep. Anyway, so I'm going backwards for the moment, but it'll be good. It'll yeah. be good. I'm hoping to get it finished. He's getting the there and he's learning. You're learning. I'm this learning. Is, this I'm is learning is a to part... drive backwards. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> This part of decreasing while staying in pattern, you can't do on a podcast. You've yeah, got to sit I, do down. Know what, do you know what happened? I think I have found it. I made the mistake going around the corner, okay? okay. When I, yeah, so I messed up the counting because it's, it's slightly irregular because you are decreasing. It sort of goes groups of three, three, two, three, three, two. Yeah. And I'd go three, three, two, three, two, three, three, two. Mm. Yeah. And that happened okay. right here. So that was... Well, keep uh, unpicking. Wrong. Yeah. So I'll go back to concentrating on this. <laughs> if you watched our last episode with the interview from Carson Demers, you will have heard him say that it's not good to sit knitting for many hours at a time. So we're going to get up and stretch our legs, go for a quick walk in the woods. Get some fresh air. Get some fresh air. We'll be back shortly. See you soon. and this is my latest design Anne and Co. It's called after my mother and she's called Anneko and this is just her type of yarn and just her color. It's a Rome kit silk case in colorway 595 and it's the burgundy. I've used one ball only. You can make it larger and then you need more yarn. Um, you can use circular needles. I advise size 16 inches or 24 inches and straight needles can be used also if you like that better like me. Um, US knitters use uh, US 6 for casting on, then US 5 for working the cowl and US 1.5 for the button bands on either side. Um, for European knitters you use 4mm needles to cast on, 3.75mm for working the cowl and 2.5cm for uh, the both, both button bands. The end size will be 25 inches wide and 15 inches high or for Europeans, 69 centimeters wide and 32 centimeters high. Um, after you cast on, you start immediately with working the lace pattern because that's where you get an um, instant beginning of the shawl and it doesn't curl anyway. So um, it's a leaf lace pattern. It's worked on both sides. That means that on front row you work uh, leaf lace and on the back uh, rows in pearl stitches. And it makes for a beautiful leaf shape and it's quite open and you can work it on larger needles and it still will hold its shape. Um, after you've given the shawl the length and you bind off the stitches, then you can use the finer needles and make the button bands on either side. 
I've used four buttons and four buttonholes, so you can wear it in various ways. I've used it on the uh, mannequin now with only one button, but if you want to make it smaller and more fitting around your neck, then you can um, close up all the buttons. Um, the yarn is very fuzzy. That means that you have to be very uh, careful how you knit, and that's why I advise you to swatch. So you can try out the pattern and work out any mistakes or difficulties before you start working the project. When you make a mistake, you have to undo your knitting, try to lay it out flat and then pull at your work because otherwise, because the yarn is so fuzzy, you could take up more stitches than you want to. If you want to knit this, you can find it in my Ravelry store at A Passion for Lace and on my Etsy shop. It's also called A Passion for Lace. Enjoy knitting it. Thank you to Monique. That's a beautiful lace cow, and it's great that it comes in at just one skein of the Rowan Kid Silk Haze. Yeah. Um, Monique was our guest on episode 28 for an interview, and she also was our guest for our last Fruity Knitting Live event for our Shetland patrons. We have our next live event coming up on the 1st of July, and our guest will be Anne Budd. Anne Budd is an expert in all aspects of the craft of knitting. She has written books on many different topics, top-down, bottom-up, garments, socks. She can do it all. Yeah. These events are a great opportunity for our patrons to speak to Anne or speak to whoever guest it is. Um, so if you're a Shetland or a Merino, please get your questions in and we'll put them to her. A recording of the event will be available afterwards for Merinos and upwards. Yeah. And Anne's just a really cool, fun person, so you could ask yeah. her lots of, lots of questions. And she does these fun retreats. I want to take the opportunity now to thank our patrons, both old and new, for your amazing support. Without your financial support, we wouldn't be able to keep doing this. This is now a full-time job for me with the organising and planning of the content of the show and the organising and planning of all of the guests we have on the show, as well as the filming and the editing and the supporting website. We don't get financial support from uh, advertising or sponsorship. It is now my full-time work. So we do like to ask our viewers that if you particularly like our podcast. I know that there's a lot of podcasts out there, but if you particularly value how we put our content together, to please consider becoming a patron so that we can keep doing this and keep providing you with a great show every two weeks. I'm going to do a very quick review of this book, New Lace Knitting, by Romy Hill, who you're going to meet very soon in the interview. And in the interview, she's going to show you about four of the garments and one of the shawls and, and talk about them from this book. But there's 19 patterns in all, and I wanted to show and talk about a couple of the other patterns that Romy won't be talking about. This is going to be one of the gifts for the lace knit along. So it's a collection of um, traditional patterns and and variations that you can do on them. So there's six chapters and each chapter has a theme and the theme will be a motive, a traditional pattern or a motive that's quite well known. And Romy takes these motives and slices them up and using different yarn weights and different styling techniques shows how versatile these traditional patterns can be when they're used in different ways. And each chapter has about three or four patterns to support that theme. So I just want to uh, show you two chapters which I find particularly gorgeous. So the first chapter I want to talk about is chapter three and that uses the traditional pattern or motive of leaf and trellis. And I looked up the origins of the leaf and trellis pattern and it dates back to the 18th century. So it's quite amazing to think that women back in the early 1700s were knitting fine white lace out of cotton in this same design and 300 years later we're still stitching this same design. So knitting is such a great direct uh, connection back to these previous eras. So there's two patterns in here that I want to show you that are very different from each other and the first one is a shawl and it's called the Oak Flat Road Shawl. And Romy has used panels of leaf, the, the leaf design, around the edges of the shawl. So two panels coming down the front 
and two on the back and the shawl is, is um, knitted top down. And then you can see the whole body of the shawl is made out of very tiny diamond motifs. And because the motifs are very tiny, it does look like a mesh construction, which is like a trellis construction. And then around the bottom of the shawl, you've got a chevron wave. And a chevron pattern is just some form of a wave pattern. And again, that's done in a very um, mesh-like stitch, which is like the trellis. Yeah, so that's really cool how she's used the pattern there. And then in a completely different garment, a skirt, which I thought I'd show you, and that's the Hope Valley flounce. She's used the same motifs and it's got all of the variations of the leaf and trellis pattern in this. So this is a top-down skirt and it's a really cool denim skirt because it's made, the yarn is made out of recycled denim blue jeans. That's really cool. It is, it? yeah. So you start at the waist and it's stocking stitch to ease into the pattern. You increase around the hips and then you've got an eyelet pattern, which again looks a bit like a trellis design. Underneath the eyelet pattern, you've got a section of diamonds. Underneath the diamonds, you've got the chevron, which is just the wave, and it also looks a bit trellisy. And then under that, you've got the full blown leaf and trellis pattern in all of its glory. And what's particularly cool about this skirt is that the hemming is worked perpendicular to the skirt. So you start with a provisional cast on, you work around, and then you graft the two ends together. So I think that's a super cool design. They're two very, very different garments using the same traditional motif. The next chapter I want to show you is chapter six, and that is the twining lily panel, which is also a very traditional motif. And the, the first cardigan I want to show you is the Bright Moment cardigan. And here, in this chapter, she's just varied uh, the garments by how much of this twining lily motif she's, she's put into the garment. So how much lace is in the garment and also she's varied it by using different yarn weights. So the first one, the first cardigan, it's an all over body lace. And it looks really difficult to start off with, but it's easy because if you look at it closely, she's just simply repeated the panels of the twining lilies. So it's a 20 stitch repeat and you're just repeating those panels. It's also knitted from the bottom up in pieces. So you've got the back piece and the two front pieces. So you knit them up to the armholes. You cast off in a straight line for a modified drop shoulder. And the way she's placed the, the, the cast off, it doesn't interrupt a pattern repeat. So you're not left halfway through a pattern repeat to continue and, and to continue working while staying in the pattern. You don't have any of that worry. And so the end result is it looks like a drop shoulder, but you've got less bulk under the arms. The sleeves are just simply uh, stocking stitch. And I reckon this design is great for a lot of different body shapes and it's in a fingering weight. So I think that's gorgeous. And then in comparison to that, if you have a look at the little city tee, that just uses very elegantly two panels of this twining lily on either side of the neckline. And the rest of it is just a very easy stocking stitch knit. So again, it's knitted from the bottom in the round up to the armholes, that's a very easy thing to do. And then you're separating and knitting the front and the back separately. And if you have a look, there's pleats on the caps of the sleeve and that just gives it a sort of an extra fullness and makes it a little bit more elegant. So I think it's cool the way she's used on one garment, this uh, twining li lily motif all over and the other one just two tiny panels. So each chapter, as I said, is just exploring a different traditional lace motif and how versatile it can be. The charts are really good. I think they're, they're nice and big. I've certainly used smaller charts in different books, but um, I tend to enlarge my charts anyway. The photographs are really clear. They show all of the details that you actually need to see when you're checking out a pattern. And throughout it, there's a whole lot of little tips on technical things that you can learn. So I think it's a brilliant book that, that's got some really timeless designs. And as I said before, I'm super proud to be able to give it away as a present.
Our fruity lace garment and hap knit along is coming to an end at the end of June. 30th of June is the final date. Uh, so please get your finished objects in there. We would like to celebrate the huge participation that we have had in this cow by doing another selfie collage. If you've been watching Fruity Knitting from the start, you'll have seen this for a couple of earlier cows. The idea is that you get 20 seconds to introduce yourself, your pattern, tell us what yarn you're using and show us your finished object, so your garment or your hap. Um, we would love to see lots of entries for that, so get into it. We will have the full instructions on the finished objects thread. Um, yeah, keep it short, keep it snappy. We need to keep it moving. Um, try to pay attention to the sound, speak up nice and clearly <laughs> and make sure there are no airplanes or trucks going by. It makes it a little bit easier for me with the sound. So yeah, we would love you all to get into that. And uh, is there anything else? No, that's it. Good. I think we're up now to our interview. You're about to meet the lovely Romy Hill. She is a very multi-talented lady with a gorgeous aesthetic. You're going to enjoy the interview and we'll look forward to seeing you again in two weeks' time. Yep. Thanks very much for being with us today. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. My guest today is Romy Hill and she is an amazing knitwear designer, particularly of lace garments and shawls. As you know, we're holding a lace garment and hat knit along right now and I've been looking around to try to find a book that would be a wonderful prize for the knit along. And when I saw Romy's latest book of designs, New Lace Knitting, I was thrilled because it really is a book of beautiful and timeless designs that I'm very happy to give away. I was then even more thrilled when Romy agreed to the interview. So Romy's work has been published in Vogue Knitting, Interweave Knits, Knit Scene and Twist Collective amongst numerous other books. She's also known for her crochet and knitting jewellery making skills and her classes on Craftsy. So Romy, it's fantastic to have you with us today and a very warm welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and I really appreciate your inviting me. You've got a really interesting uh, story about how you got into designing knitwear. So we want to hear the details about that because you actually started off as a jewellery maker. But before that, just start with a really brief account of your crafting background. Well, I come from a really crafty family. So I've been crafting since I was a small child. And I learned to crochet first because... Um, my family was really into crochet. So I grew up with my mother and my grandmother and my grandmother made these incredible intricate lace tablecloths. And she used that tiny, tiny little crochet thread and the hooks that feel like fish hook barbs in your thumbs, believe me, I know. <sighs> and uh, my mother was a huge crocheter as well. So that was the first thing that I learned to do. And then I learned how to do beading. And I begged and begged my mother to teach me how to knit because I love the way that the stitches line up and I just thought it was beautiful. And so she finally relented. And um, I've done all sorts of craftsy thing, crafty things. Um, I've crocheted, knit, sewed, uh, beaded, and I started doing some metalworking when I was doing my master's in um, broadcasting. And um, that was where I 
kind of got my love of metal. So, wow, when I discovered lace knitting um, later in life, I needed something to kind of keep the shawls on my shoulders because I'm sort of a twitchy, fiddly kind of person. So they kept falling off my shoulders and I designed some shawl pins and I was showing them off to my um, local yarn store owner. And she said, oh, I want some for the shop. So I brought some in and my business was kind of born that way. And then I started designing um, to have something to put my shawl pins on, basically. And what you started designing with was already quite um, complex. When I look at your early lace designs, they're beautiful. And what's interesting to me is that you're best known as a jewelry designer and a knitwear designer, but you've also got some really good artistic and creative skills using different mediums. And to me, metal and fiber are so opposing, like metal to me is cold and hard and relatively unyielding and fiber is really warm and soft and very yielding. So what interests me is what's it like for you to be creating in all of these different mediums and where does it overlap for you creatively? That's kind of an interesting story and um, one I have asked myself actually for quite some time. But I think in the end, it's that I love to create beautiful things. So the medium is sort of secondary to my goal of doing something beautiful. And um, I have actually worked in a lot of media. So crochet, knitting, macrame, pottery, um, some weaving, sewing and the jewelry making of course and I was an illustrator and a graphic designer for a while um, and I got my undergrad degree in French horn performance and um, I think a lot of people were a little annoyed with me when I quit playing but I think in the end it came down to I really just want to create something beautiful with whatever it is that I'm doing so when I was playing horn I was really interested in creating a beautiful tone and lyrical and beautiful phrases and so it's just translated and for a while it's sort of I didn't understand that other people didn't love the feel of knitting with wire and um, hard things like I did but then I realized for a lot of people, it's the feeling of the fiber slipping through your hands. Whereas for me, it's just, I am so focused on creating that beautiful item that I don't even really think about the medium as I'm doing it. I'm just like, oh, I, I have a goal in mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you told me earlier about the story of when you went to Venice and you saw a beautiful gateway made out of iron that was also looking a bit like lace. So tell us about that. I took a trip to Venice and my it was with my mother and we were just wandering through the back alleys and came upon this incredibly beautiful gate. And it looked like a trace work of metal with big pieces of glass caught up in it. And I didn't know at the time that it was the back gate to the Peggy Guggenheim house. Yeah. And it just stuck in my head. It's just the most beautiful thing. And so when I got back, I thought, oh, you know, I think I could maybe recreate that a little bit with wire knitting and beads. So I started kind of playing with that too. And actually, one of your early successes was your book, uh, Elements of Style, which is a knit and crochet jewellery book. And that was published in 2008 by Interweave, I think. Mm -hmm. so, yes. so tell us, how did that come into being? That was kind of a little bit of a funny story because I didn't know what I was doing at all in the least. So um, I had had a couple of patterns in Nitty. On, uh, it's an online magazine for knitting and I'd done some wire knitting and then also some bead knitting um, for jewelry and I thought oh this would I think I, I'm going to ask if they would do a book so I just emailed and said would you be interested in a book of, um, of knitted and crocheted jewelry and not knowing anything at all of course um, they wrote me right back and said, 
we would be interested. Um, can you sort of give us a little bit more information and maybe a little bit of a proposal? And so I sent along just a really brief proposal. I think it was only about 10 pages, which is kind of insane. Yeah. And, um, and they said, that looks great. So I think I hit it just exactly at the time where they wanted to try something new like that. And um, so the book was in different sections and there's wires, um, fiber and felting. And I use beads throughout and there's both knit and crocheted um, jewelry. That sounds really beautiful. And what about the process of making the book? Was that uh, a big learning curve for you? Did you, were you also, did you have a say in the photography and the layout of the book or was that basically up to them? So doing a book is a huge learning curve, mostly because you think that because you've designed patterns before that you can do this no problem. And in reality, it takes over your life completely and totally. And this is even without, um, Interweave does not let you have any kind of input into the photo sessions. So, or the design basically. So they decided how they were going to have it look and um, just the patterns themselves. I mean, basically took over my life and my family didn't see me <laughs> for a while. <laughs> Let's talk now about your typical designing process because I find it very interesting in how a designer starts. So do they start with the fabric or the concept of the fabric and the texture or the colours that they want to work with or do they start with the silhouette of a garment or the structure of the shawl first and then fill in the, the pattern. So I want you to talk a bit about that, what it's like for you. And because you're known as a lace designer, um, it's interesting to me, what kinds of lace traditions have influenced your work, like the Shetland lace tradition or the Estonian lace tradition? Wow, that is a meaty question. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I have kind of a varied design process because different things will inspire me. So um, for, for an incredibly beautiful bit of yarn that I find, um, that is what inspires me and I kind of go from there and it tells me what it wants to be and I listen to it. I've learned to listen to my yarn. And um, so I will try to sort of fit the garment to the yarn. On the other hand, I might be looking through a stitch dictionary. Like I, I do actually have quite a few stitch dictionaries, um, Estonian and Japanese and Shetland, and I love stitch dictionaries. I, I can't get enough of them. Yeah. And a, the stitch in the dictionary may inspire me to design something, or I could be going for a walk or something like that and it just is so beautiful that that inspires me. So lots of different things sort of add to it, but I think that the unifying thing is that um, I start designing things in my head um, along with kind of using all of my sensory inputs. And um, I'm really visual, so I go through sort of the image of how the design is developing and then um, I think that's basically the unifying concept. Things sort of float around in my head. Um, I do love all sorts of different knitting traditions and I have tons of books on the subject and so I really love to use an old tradition and sort of put a modern twist on it. So when you say that you're very visual, does that mean that um, you almost have the design done in your head before you even start drawing things out. Is that right? Pretty much, I do. Um, I do. I, I pretty much have the visual of the design in my head, and I often do a lot of the engineering of it in my head as well. So figure out how the actual knit stitches will work and how it will be able to be shaped. And so that's sort of going on in my head while I'm knitting other things or walking or washing the dishes or vacuuming or anything like that. And then I just grab my pencil and paper and start sketching out. And um, I sketch up and make notes on it. And then I start swatching the fabric, which is very important. And then do you knit your full garments or do you send that off to a test knitter? 
Um, I generally knit every single thing that I design. Once in a while, I will send it off to a test knitter with a giant, giant swatch. But the thing about um, knitting up the garment is, while I, when I chart it out, I'll kind of have an idea of how it's going to look, and I swatch it, and that can kind of change from the swatch to the finished garment. So a larger garment can change the knit stitches around or make things pull in different ways with the shaping that I wouldn't have anticipated in just the swatch. So I actually like to knit my garments so I can see how things are coming along. And I do actually tweak them as I'm knitting. So I try not to just have a sample knitter do everything for me. Though I do have everything test knitted. Yeah. So when you're knitting the garment, do you knit it to sit, to fit yourself or do you knit it to fit a, a larger size? Because it must be so difficult to get when you're working with uh, putting or placing pattern motives to, to imagine they can be very different from a small size <laughs> to a large size, can't they? It's almost like a different yes. design. Yes, and sometimes they end up in unfortunate places. <laughs> so, yes, I, I do actually think about that a lot. And um, for a book or for other samples, it has to be knit to a size 6. So that's a U.S. size 6. Okay. So I have a U.S. size 6 dress form, and I knit it to fit that dress form. And then there are sizing standards. So... I work really hard to make sure that there aren't any motifs in unfortunate places <laughs> and um, and that that nothing falls off the shoulders and that it will actually fit because as bodies increase and decrease in size, they don't really do it in a uniform way. Absolutely. So yeah. super, super important, especially with the shoulders. That's so true. And that's really, ta that's why I think garment, designers have to have that extra skill don't they it's you know it I sometimes I almost lie awake thinking about <sighs> how to make it fit and look good on different body types yeah I could imagine so. well good for you for putting in the effort <laughs> And just to get back to the idea of silhouette or pattern textures, is there a difference in general between how you uh, go about designing a shawl pattern compared to a, a garment? Like with the garments, do you start in general more with the silhouette than you would with a shawl and then do the pattern? Or is it not really a, something that you can say is definite? I do actually go about it differently. I conceive of the garment and the silhouette of the garment, and then I find stitch patterns and details to fit the silhouette that I see. So I kind of visualize it on a person and think about how it drapes and how it would enhance the face. I think about the neckline and um, just the way that the sleeves would fit. And then I start trying to find a good pattern that I can put into that overall silhouette that will be able to be resized and still look good on different people. Yeah. Um, for a shawl, it's just sort of like playtime with patterns and geometry. <laughs> so uh, I find stitches that I really love. And I just, I sort of design the shawl shape from the stitches that I really love. Um, some of them I will take from Stitch Dictionaries and a lot of times I edit them so that I can do a different shaping in the shawl. But yeah, it's, it's pretty different um, because a shawl is sort of like a blank canvas. So I get to play a lot with color and shape and form, which I love. And what I particularly love about your garments is that they, are, they do have a variety of silhouettes. They're not just a, a, a typical style. You really go to town on, on uh, using a variety of, of styles, and I love that. That's, Thank you. Yeah, that's great. So let's now talk about the, your favourite fibres to work with, because I know that you also you tend to use quite a lot of mixed fibres, but you also have a lot of knowledge about using the correct fibre and the correct fleece type for the right kind of project or construction. So tell us what you've learned on this and what your thoughts are. Oh my gosh, I could talk for hours about this. Good. So. <laughs> 
Fiber is incredibly important. So when I was growing up, my mother uh, tailored all of her own clothes. So I actually think of knitting as creating a fabric for your garment. So for instance, you wouldn't use a broadcloth for a sweatshirt and you wouldn't use silk for a hard-wearing sweater. So I think a lot about uh, the way the fiber is going to work up into the garment that I'm designing. And for shawls, I want to have a more drapey fiber. So I like silk blends and rayons of bamboo, milk fiber, soy, that type of thing, hemp and linen blends. And I find that um, just a like a 50% silk or 50% bamboo will give a wool a much drapier look to it and you'll be able to let the lace keep its block which is a big thing so everything will block out but something like a really springy merino will just sort of go scrunch back into its original size yeah. and we kind of had a joke that when you're knitting up a shawl in a like a merino sock yarn basically the the lace that you end up with that size is pretty much what it's going to go back to after a few weeks because it has all of that memory in it so um, for a sweater merino is fantastic because it's nice and springy but not for a shawl so for something drapey I tend to go more for a long wool, um, the longer staple. And also the way that the wool is prepared has a huge um, play into it. So I tend to look for something that is not overly twisted and it's not as springy for a shawl. For a sweater that I want to keep its shape, um, definitely I'm going to go for the springier wool and I do kind of a little spring test I just take a piece of wool between my fingers and pull it and see how much it pulls out and then springs back and that will show me how well it will keep its block in the end if there's a lot of memory to it then that's not going to keep a block very well and I love all fibers so um, and I think they're great for different things. It's just that I, I tend to make really sure that I find the right fiber for the job that I'm doing. Yeah, that's so important, isn't it? And particularly it if people are substituting yarns, but they still want to get yes. their gorgeous design at the end that you've given them. <laughs> Hugely important, and I just want to put a plug in here for swatching. I know it's a dirty word to a lot of people, <laughs> but that is how you're going to see how your finished garment will behave. So for lace, that's especially important because of all the negative space in there. And with that negative space, the yarn will do more what it wants to do. So if you have a merino, for instance, you can still use it for a shawl if you're absolutely determined to, to use that yarn. But you just have to realize that you'll probably need extra yardage and a larger needle to get to the result that you want. I, I totally believe in swatching as well. And more and more people are talking about it. So I think knitters are taking it on more yes. reluctantly. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so behind you, Rummy, you've got some gorgeous designs that are coming out of that have come out of your book, New Lace Knitting. Um, so we're going to have a look at those designs in more detail. But first of all, I did notice on the cover of your book, you've written designs for wide open spaces. And I know that you live in Nevada. So I do. tell us about how, how does the environment where you live uh, influence what you design and how you design? The environment I live always influences how I design. And right now I live out in the boonies <laughs> in probably the most one of the most beautiful places because I can't say the most beautiful Venice is right up there. <laughs> um, so one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen and the sky is big and blue and the light is golden and incredible and the space I'm just kind of looking out the window behind you there <laughs> and the space is it's just so vast and incredible going outside gives you a sense of your place in the world, how small you are and how vast and incredible the world is. And it puts my mind to peace. So 
which I guess is really the thing that influences me the most, the way that um, I'm able to reach that point where my mind is at peace and the muse sort of strikes me. I can totally relate to that. Landscape for me is so important. I'm very envious of, of your description. <laughs> but for it's beautiful. Me, yeah, for me, hiking in nature is up there as one of the most important things. And I, I do totally relate to it, it, giving you a sense of connection and peace. And from that spot, you, you create the most easily, yes. don't you? Yes, yeah. definitely. So what's exciting about this book is one of the things that's exciting, and I have to say it's a really great book. The more I look into it, I can see there's so much detail into it, and it's oh, beautifully put together. The charts are, are, are great, and you've got a whole lot of little tips here on how to do things just a little bit with a little bit of extra care that really make the projects work well in the end. And and what you seem to have done is taken a set of motives or stitch patterns and shown how differently they can look by um, using, by styling them differently, using different yarn weights and also mixing them, the patterns up between shawls and garments. So I'd love to see more about that. And yeah, so show us, <laughs> show us what you've got. So I took um, six different lace patterns and their traditional lace stitch patterns. And I have, like, as you said, I put in sort of modern details and different silhouettes. And I played with them. So in some of them, I sliced and diced and I took little pieces of the pattern to use in my patterns, in my written patterns. So now I'll show you some of my patterns and kind of talk about how I put them together and the little twists on the traditional stitches I used. This is the town square shawl and it's from the diamond fantasia stitch section in my book and it's based on some Estonian stitch patterns and then also some other traditional patterns and you can see here in the border I've used the full um, traditional stitch pattern that is for the section. And what I've done is mirrored pieces of it in the rest of the shawl. So the top here just uses the diamond portion of it. And then the whole pattern is shown in the edge. Um, I use noops in there. And this is a little bit of a different construction from a typical Estonian shawl in that you start right here at the bottom of the center triangle, and then you work up using short rows. And at the end, you have all of your stitches on the needle to start working the border. This is the Manzanita tee, and it's also the cover sweater for the book. And it's in the same Diamond Fantasia section. And for this one, it's a very simple tee and simple shape. And I just took the trellis sort of bit of the Diamond Fantasia stitch pattern and used it as the yoke. And it actually is able to be shaped just by using that lace pattern up top because lace has a larger gauge than um, plain stockinette stitch. And my favorite little piece here is um, the neckline. It has, it has enough room so that it can cowl out and sort of sweep across. But the um, bind off right below the section that is an eye cord, so that keeps it from falling off of your shoulders, which is very important. I love that design, and that's also my favorite part. I think it's so elegant. I, I really want to knit that one. Oh, good. I think it would look amazing on you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite pieces from the book, and it's called the Saltgrass Pull, and it's based on a traditional fisherman's sweater, a Gansey, except that it's knit from the top down, and of course, fishermen never wore lace. So yes. <laughs> this one is lace all over. And it has a shoulder strap that starts all the way up at the top and continues down the sleeve. That's and beautiful. Thank you. And it ends in a little point at the, at the end here. It's worked all in one piece. And it has a, an underarm gusset, 
for freedom of movement. So Great. basically what I wanted was kind of a lace sweatshirt, something that you could wear any day and it would be incredibly comfortable. And um, it's shaped up top here with short rows and in the back with short rows. And it has a lot of range of movement and it's, it's got a modified drop shoulder. And yes. fun piece of trivia, I actually blocked it on a woolly horse. <laughs> so okay. the traditional um, blocking and it worked perfectly. So I, I really like this one. It's done in a, a woolen spun yarn, which is really, really light and keeps a block really beautifully. So the lace pattern stays nice and open and um, it doesn't spring back out of its block. This is my talus cardigan, and it's from the section on waves and ripples. And um, that section uses feather and fan or old shale. And everybody who knows me knows I'm a really terrible punster. So the talus name is actually sort of an homage to um, the old shale stitch pattern, because talus is a broken pile of rock, a slope formed by a broken pile of rock or rocks at the base of a cliff. So shale and rock, <laughs> one, of those, <laughs> one of those things. Cute little private jokes you've <laughs> yeah, got. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So this one is actually um, done from the top down and it's just a traditional raglan increase. And then um, it, it's patterned after a hap shawl. So in the back, in the back here, it's got a little bit of a point and then it increases um, right down the center here. So that gives the sweater a little bit of a swing and it's based on a hap shawl. So I actually used a lace weight, like a heavy lace weight Shetland yarn. Um, it's from Montana wool and it was spun in the US and then naturally dyed in California. So that was sort of my way of uh, connecting the Shetland tradition with America and the West. Beautiful. And I was reading about it in the book and it's actually quite an easy pattern to knit, isn't it? Although it, it looks is. quite complicated. It's, it's good for a, um, an ad perhaps an advanced beginner. Yes, definitely. It looks way more difficult than it is. It's, it's a great bang for your buck. <laughs> <laughs> just because it is that really simple um, construction, just the top-down construction that lots of knitters are used to doing. Yes, and the, and the body's in garter stitch, isn't it? It is. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's lovely. Great. This is my Willowa cardigan, and it's probably my favorite thing from the book. It's based on the print of the wave um, stitch pattern, and the top part is knit from side to side, and then the bottom is picked up around the base of the lace and knit straight down. So it makes for some really interesting shoulder detail. And um, I just love this one so much. And uh, Willowa, for those who don't know, it's a sudden gust of wind that blows down from the mountains over the water. So I like to kayak around where I live and I've gotten caught in many Willowas. <laughs> so. That pattern is really descriptive. It just does look like that, doesn't it? The, the ripples are on a lake. It does to me too. Thank you so much. I have to change my opinion. I'm not sure whether to do that one or the other one because that is really gorgeous as well. You should do both. <laughs> I should do both. Right. I have to wait for my arms to recover. Right. But, yeah. That is really important. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, thank you so much for being with us on the on the podcast. It's been great to meet you, great to hear you talk about your work. I think you're an excellent designer. I'm super impressed by the detail that's in your book, um, and I'm excited to give it away as a, as a gift for our knit, al knit along. And, um, yeah, so thank you so much again for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It was just a pleasure getting to know you and chat with you. Thanks. Great. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.